Okay, hi everybody. Um, my name is Micah Lee. Um, as, uh, as part of my job as a journalist, I have to accept documents from strangers that are untrusted and open them to see what's in them uh, all the time. And, uh, you know, Cubes makes this job much easier, um, along with a lot of other parts of my job. And I'm going to uh, go into exactly how. Um, so, Cubes is an operating system, but it's kind of fundamentally different than the operating system most of us are familiar with, like Windows or Mac OS or Debian or Fedora or Ubuntu. Um, in Cubes, you have this uh, thin layer uh, called uh, DOM0. It runs a hypervisor called Xen, and basically everything else is run inside of virtual machines. Um, the virtual machines, uh, uh, they provide isolation and they can do a lot of cool things. And so uh, different virtual machines are called different security domains. So for example, you could have a virtual machine that is very untrustworthy and you use this to open up like a sketchy PDF. Um, or you could have a very like trusted virtual machine that doesn't have any network access and you keep your password database in there. Um, and there's disposable virtual machines and all sorts of other stuff that I'm gonna go into. So um, before I could jump in, I'm going to show you, oh, and the reason why it's not all the way full screen is because I can only see this much on my screen. <laughs> um, I don't think that it's Cube's fault. I think that it's the display's fault. Anyways, uh, um, okay. <laughs> so I'm going to show you the Cube Manager. Um, this is a list of all of the virtual machines that are on my computer. These like little green circles means it's powered on right now. Um, so you have template VMs. And so in my case, these are my template VMs. There's Debian, Fedora, and then Hunix VMs, which are Tor VMs, which I'm going to uh, go into more. Um, then you have app VMs. So app VMs are based on template VMs. So the idea is that, uh, like for example, your email VM would be an app VM, and it has its own home directory, so it has its own like private storage, um, but it shares the same root file system with your template. So if you wanted to like install a new piece of software in one of your app VMs, you actually install that software in your template VM, and when you and so uh, you know if uh, I update my Fedora 28 template then I update the software in all of these VMs that are based on Fedora 28. Um, and then there's also standalone VMs. And so these are basically like app VMs, except uh, they have their own root storage. And so they're super useful if you're going to make a domain that you want to just install random stuff in. So like if you're playing capture the flag, you want to install a bunch of hacking tools, you want to run weird binaries, you don't want to mess up anything else in your system, uh, using a standalone VM is great for that. Um, and it also supports Windows and installing, uh, you know, arbitrary operating systems from ISOs. Um, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about that too. Okay, so to start, uh, I'm gonna show you about window decorations. So let's go ahead and open um, files in my personal VM. And it takes a second to open because you'll see um, it pops up a thing in the corner, uh, a notification. Um, and it's booting up a VM right now. Then let's also open files in my work VM. So the personal VM is open. So the first thing that you'll notice is that the window decorations are different. Um, this, my files VM is, uh, has yellow windows, and my work VM is about to pop up. Um, and it also says personal, so you can see what domain you're currently looking at. Let me make sure. Okay, and so um, my work VM is blue and it says work. And so the window decorations are part of uh, DOM0 actually. So uh, my super trusted domain, the one that's running my window manager, controls the window decorations. So it's impossible for like my work VM to open a window that looks like my personal VM. It always has to have these this blue window decorations. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and uh, show you how moving files around works. So let's go into a different folder. You could just drag files like normal um, if it's part of the same domain. So you could drag files from work to work. But you can't drag files from work to personal. And these are different virtual machines. There's no way for them to communicate 
between each other on their own. But if you really want to copy a file between them, what you can do is right click on a file and copy to other AppVM. Um, so now it pops up a window in DOM0 asking for my permission. And I tell it what VM I want. And now I have a cubes incoming folder. Oops. Work. And I've copied the file. So you can totally copy files between VMs, and it's not a problem. But you need to, uh, uh, the user needs to give like explicit consent. Um, so malware can't do that for you. So I'm going to open up a couple of text files and show you how copying and pasting works. So let's go ahead, select this, and copy it. So I can just um, right click and paste. But then if I come over here, right click, there's nothing on the clipboard over here. Because again, they're different virtual machines, so they have different clipboards. So if I want to actually copy and paste between virtual machines, let's copy. So what I do is I have this window highlighted, um, and then I press Control Shift C. And so what it just did is it took whatever was in my work VM's clipboard and copied it to a global cubes clipboard. Then I select this window and press Control Shift V. And it took what was in the global cubes clipboard and, paste, and copied it into the personal clipboard. And now I can right click and paste, and you can copy between VMs. So it's basically like if you want to break the isolation by moving files or by copying and pasting, you can totally do it. You just, just DOM0 needs to give explicit consent. Um, all right. Disposable VMs for web browsing. So this is um, pretty much. Okay, so Fedora 28, DVM, Google Chrome. Uh, what I'm doing is I'm opening up a disposable VM, and this is pretty much how I do almost all of my web browsing. I have a couple of VMs where I uh, uh, have some stuff stored in my browser, but for the most part, it's um, all disposable. So what this means is that there was a uh, Cubes just created a new VM. It's called Disp with a random number at the end. Um, powered on the VM, opened up Chrome, uh, and now, boom, I just have a web browser. I can do whatever I want. I can like go to sketchy websites, get malware on my computer, whatever. And then as soon as I click this X, the VM gets deleted and destroyed, and it, does, it never existed. Um, and so it's pretty awesome. And disposable VMs can be used for plenty of cool things uh, other than just having you know very private, private browser mode. Um, so for example, I have this set of sketchy documents. So Hacking Team is an Italian surveillance company. Uh, they, uh, uh, their customers are uh, governments and law enforcement. And a lot of the uh, government customers are pretty repressive and have used their uh, products and services to hack activists and things like that. A few years ago, they got hacked. All of their email got dumped on the internet. This, these are some random attachments from their email. And their email attachment, attachments include like live malware, because their customers would just send an email to hacking team being like, here's a bait document. It's like a you know, docx word document. Can you please add your malware to it? And then they would add malware and reply. And they're like, here you go. Send your phishing email. So <laughs> exploit.docx, for example, uh, you could just right click on it and view and disposable VM. So this creates a brand new virtual machine, copies this document to the virtual machine, and then opens it. And then as soon as that process, in this case, um, it's a docx, so the LibreOffice process closes, the uh, uh, virtual machine gets destroyed. So in this case, this wasn't actually, I don't think, I mean, I didn't like do forensics on it, but I don't think that this actually was malware. I think this is just a Word document with emails copied and pasted in it. But um, uh, if it was malware, and if it did actually exploit LibreOffice and hack this computer, it wouldn't matter because it would just be hacking disp2228, and disp228 doesn't have any private data in it at all. Um, and then as soon as I click the X, it, the VM gets destroyed. Um, so another really cool thing that Cubes supports is th things called trusted PDFs. Uh, it only works with PDFs at the moment. There's not like a similar thing for Office documents. But um, like here's a PDF. Uh, so let's go ahead and right click and uh, convert to trusted PDF. So what this is doing is 
let's say I have this PDF and I don't trust it. I don't think that, I think it might be malicious, I don't know, but I wanna send it to like a colleague and they're not using Cube, so they can't just open it in a disposable VM, but I wanna make it safe for them. When I do this, what I do is Cubes creates a new disposable VM, copies the PDF into the VM, and then basically like flattens it and turns it into a giant list of pixels and returns the pixel data. And then my work VM that started this takes the pixels and turns it into a PDF. So basically, it removes any possibility of malware being in the final document. And now I have the same PDF except .trusted.pdf. And I can look at it. So um, this PDF is now completely safe for me to like open it in my normal VMs, not disposable VMs, or send it to people that I work with and they can open it and it's not gonna hack them. Um, a couple of things about trusted PDFs is because it, it's just pixel data and it's all flattened, it removes the text data. So you can't actually select text anymore. And then also, if you go, uh, it created this cubes untrusted PDFs folder. Here's the original. The original is 6.3 megabytes and the trusted is nine megabytes. So it makes the file size bigger. But it's super worth it because you could take random PDFs that you don't trust that might have malware and make them safe to view before you view them but before you share them. Okay, so a really cool thing about cubes is vaults, and in fact, this PDF uh, for the slides is inside of a vault. Vaults are just VMs that don't have network access. And by not having network access, here, let me actually open a terminal in this vault. It just doesn't have an ethernet device. There's just no way to make network connections from these VMs. Um, so let's open files. All right. So vaults are great for a couple of things. They're good for password databases. They're good for sensitive documents that you uh, want to keep safe so that if one part of your computer gets hacked, uh, you keep the documents way safer. So like if I were you know, using Thunderbird and someone uses, sends me an email that exploits Thunderbird, um, you know, my leaked documents are still safe. The, the hacker doesn't have access to it. Um, and also here's, uh, just a cool thing. So said today is a section of the Snowden archive that we've been publishing systematically. Um, it's from the Signals Intelligence Directorate. And let me just open one of these documents that we've published in a disposable VM. Um, I actually set it up so that the Vault VM, when it opens disposable VMs, it uses a different disposable VM template. So it opens uh, Vault disposable VMs. So there's different types of disposable VMs. Um, so for example, this document right now is inside of a vault, but it's still a disposable VM. And let me, I have to look over here. Okay, so, so clicking this shows all of the active VMs, and here's, a disposable, here's the disposable VM, so let's run a terminal in it, and like, you know, it's a vault. So if I try and open, um, you know, some sort of malware that wants to phone home, it just won't be able to. It doesn't have any way to exfiltrate anything from my computer. Um, okay, so let's open Thunderbird in my email VM. So Cubes comes with a Thunderbird add-on that is pretty cool, which I will show you in a second. But basically, you can um, set it to just open all of your emails in, uh, or open all of your email attachments in disposable VMs. So, um, tools, add-ons, Cubes attachments. Here, I can't see the side of the screen. <laughs> Preferences, so you could just go in and check this box. And so by default, whenever you click on an attachment, it opens in a disposable VM. Um, so for example, I'm gonna tell a brief story. Uh, there's this American election vendor called VR Systems. Um, a team of Russian hackers working for GRU hacked this company and got access to their customer list. And then they sent spear phishing emails to their customer list, which include local election officials in North Carolina and Virginia and Florida and in lots of other places. And all of these local election officials received an email that looked just like this. And we actually know exactly what the email looked like from FOIA requests. Um, because uh, we FOIA'd their email for VR, for like VR systems. And so it looked just like this. It included an attachment that looked, that looked just like this. 
uh, that had this file name, but it was malware. And if you open it in Microsoft Word, it would have hacked their computer, installed some sort of like remote access tool for the GRU to access it, and then we don't know if anyone actually um, clicked on it and got hacked. It's possible they did. Uh, we haven't seen evidence of it. Um, but if they did, then you know the hacker would have access to everything on their computer, like all their email and not everything that their computer has access to. So like if they're connected to some sort of electrical system VPN with a whole network, the attacker would have access to that too. But if they were using cubes, they could just click on it. Wait, did I click on it? Oh yeah, I clicked on it. Um, and it would just open a disposable VM. And then even if it did actually exploit it, like include an exploit that works for LibreOffice in this case, um, and actually hack it, it would be fine because there's no data in this VM. And then as soon as you close this VM, it gets destroyed. So uh, this, I feel like, is one of the like best features of cubes is it solves like half of the phishing problem. There's like the other half of the phishing problem is like credential storage, or I mean credential stealing. Um, it doesn't quite solve that. Um, oh yeah, so here is an encrypted message. And so in this case, um, it's taking a second because my secret key is actually stored in this other vault. It's called uh, GPGVM. Um, so I actually don't have my secret keys in my email VM, I have secret keys in a vault that doesn't have access to the internet. And so uh, my GPG VM is asking if I want to get allow the email VM to access my keys. And so I could say yes. And now the GPG VM is where I type my passphrase. So even if I have malware in my email VM that's spying on all of my email, it still doesn't have it's, it doesn't have the capability to de to steal my secret key. It could it could uh, use my secret key to decrypt messages, but it'll but you know because I gave it permission for 300 seconds, um, but it pops up a notification when it does that. Um, and here, let me see. Let me open a password database. Here's my PGP passphrase. So let's go ahead and uh, copy the password and then control shift C, control shift V, and then paste the password and it decrypts the email. Um, so that's pretty cool. Okay, so Porcupine is uh, sort of a web browser. It's a little, it's not really a web browser. It's a piece of software that I wrote. Um, it's packaged in Fedora, so you can uh, like just install it in your Fedora template if you want. Um, what it does is, here, let me show you. Let's open Porcupine in uh, my email VM. So basically, you set it as your web browser, and whenever you click a link, it just copies that link to your clipboard and shows you a notification of what link you clicked. Or if you wanted to, you can choose it to uh, run a command. So for example, if you ran QVM open in DVM, you could just make it so that by default, when you click links, it opens them in disposable VMs. But I'm gonna keep it as copying it to the clipboard. So this way, uh, you know, maybe sometimes you get a link and you really wanna click it, but you're sketched out because maybe it's a sketchy link. So here, let me go ahead and open a Firefox in a disposable VM for a second and show you how Porcupine works. And this looks like a sketchy link, but I'm so curious and I trust this Micah Lee guy, um, but he sent me a sketchy link, I don't know. So I click it and it just pops up a notification telling me the link that I clicked. And then I can press Control Shift C, switch over to here, Control Shift V, and then, wait. And then paste the link. And it turns out it is kind of a sketchy link, but it's like a different type of sketchy. Um, this is a, a, an article that I wrote about um, how to run an anonymous Twitter account, and in fact, uh, in the article, you need to do a lot of stuff over Tor anonymously, and so there's a lot of doing stuff in, in Cube's uh, Hunix VMs, which I'm going to get into in a bit. Okay. Signal is an awesome app. It makes it so that it's easy to send and to encrypt messages. But it has a couple of problems, and one of those problems is that with Signal, your username is your phone number. So if you want to be able to uh, ha let people send you messages, 
um, you need to share your phone number with them. And a lot of people, especially like public figures or journalists, like have you know real legit reasons to not share their phone number with strangers. So one of the great things about uh, cubes is that you can have as many signals as you want. You just run them in different app VMs. So let's go ahead and open a couple of signal desktops. Um, so this is actually what I do myself. I have uh, uh, you know the signal that's on my phone, and I have a signal private VM with signal desktop, and then I have a different signal that's connected to like a Google Voice number. But you can use tw like like these VMs that are opening now are connected to Twilio numbers. There's lots of different ways of getting phone numbers. Um, and you could just have multiple signals running, and I just have them both up. And so, you know, strangers will send messages to Signal Public. The people I know send messages to Signal Private. And so, you know, I just have Signal Desktop. And it's like it's like trivial to just have as many compartmentalized Signal Desktops or any other software like this, where like normally, you know, it expects you to only be running one. You just make multiple VMs. OK, so um, you can run Windows in Cubes. It doesn't have the best Windows support, though. Um, it basically, if you use Windows 7, you can install Windows tools, which basically allows you to do like the shared clipboard thing and copy files into and out of the, the VM. Um, but even that, it doesn't let you like like audio doesn't work in Windows and stuff. And also, Windows 7 is like terribly old. And if you're going to be using Windows, use Windows 10. Um, uh, and it, it work, Windows 10 works too, uh, but it'll uh, just be like in a in a window, and it'll be kind of hard to get data in and to and out of it. Um, but it works, and so if you like need to use Windows, you can use it. Uh, Kali Linux works as well, but what I actually recommend here, I have a Kali VM on here, is don't install Kali itself. Instead, uh, make like a standalone VM. Um, or, or make a new template VM based on Debian, and then just add the Kali repositories to this VM. And then you can just install whatever Kali software you need, but you get the nice like cubes interface where you can move data into and out of it, and you have nice windows and window decorations. So um, this, is, this is a little project that uh, you don't, it's not actually necessary, but it's just a little tool that makes it easy to add Kali repositories to any Debian-like uh, distribution. Um, and so here, let's, oops. Um, and so, you know, I've installed some of the Kali tools in here. So I could just go ahead and do like WP scan uh, my website. I had a typo. And now I'm scanning my website for like what. Uh, WordPress plugins I have and what vulnerabilities there are and things like that. Um, and so everything just works as expected. You just need to like be familiar with the tools in Kali that you want to use because you don't have the nice menu. Um, and there's no vulnerabilities on my website. So <laughs> I'm sure there's vulnerabilities on my website. <laughs> OK, so uh, USB pass-through. Actually, is it finding anything? OK, no, nothing, nothing. <laughs> um, OK, so in cubes, you have this VM called SysUSB. Uh, I have to look at it up there. Uh, I'm going to open it. SysUSB. OK. Um, sorry. Oh, my SysUSB was not open. It's booting it up. OK. So um, normally on a computer, uh, OK, so a big difference between cubes, between cubes and other computers is that um, in most computers, you run everything in DOM0, basically. So if anything gets hacked, then, the, then your DOM0 is compromised. In cubes, you have all of these different compartmentalized, compartmentalized things. So SysUSB has access to all of my USB devices. So, and then here, and actually DOM0, here's a DOM0 terminal, doesn't have any USB devices. And also, like, let's open, um, uh, I don't know, like my a terminal in my work VM. Oops, LS USB, yeah. So uh, in cubes, all your USB devices go to SysUSB, and if you want to be able to use your USB devices in other VMs, you have to like give explicit consent. 
And you do this by clicking on this little devices drop down, and it shows a list of all the devices. And so, and also your webcam is a device, um, a, a USB device, because in laptops, normally webcams uh, are actually physically connected to a USB controller and not a PCI controller. Um, so I'm going to show a, a quick example. Let's go ahead and open Chrome in a disposable VM. I'm going to log into a Google account with a, uh, uh, well, I have to use my password manager and the copy paste stuff too. Okay, so let's go to Google, sign in. Let's copy a username, control shift C, control shift V, paste. Copy the password, control shift C, control shift V, and paste the password. Great, and I have um, U2F, so I have two-step verification turned on, so here's my YubiKey, and I'm gonna plug YubiKey in, and uh, I get a notification that I plugged a YubiKey in to SysUSB, and so SysUSB, YubiKey, attach it, to my disposable VM, and then press the button, and it logs in. So USB devices work like that. You can just uh, attach them to something, and then, and then they work. Um, and so another example is video conferencing. Um, so let's uh, go ahead and, oops, attach my uh, webcam to this disposable VM and attach my microphone to this disposable VM. And so this is actually an important thing. By default, VMs don't have any access to your microphone. So if you have malware running in anything, it can't record ambient audio in the room. You can't get spied on that way unless you explicitly give a VM permission to record your audio. And the same with your uh, microphone. So let's go to Jitsi Meet, start a, uh, a, new, a new session. And then, we're, in this case, we're giving my web browser permission. Oh, I have it covered. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, still cover your webcam, uh, obviously. Um, <laughs> and there you go. Uh, video conferencing works pretty well. Like, the downside is that video conferencing only works as well as it works in Linux. So if you're using some proprietary system, like, uh, I've had, like, terrible problems with the video and other stuff. Uh, it's not going to work very well. But, like, Jitsi Meet, Google Hangouts, stuff like that will work fine. Okay, so other USB devices. Um, I've got one of these. It's a alpha Wi-Fi hacking thing. And I just wanted to quickly demo. Uh, you can still totally use cubes for all of your hacking that you want to do. <laughs> So let's go ahead and um, open another terminal in Kali. Um, sorry. For some reason, this is the name of the alpha device. Uh, is this Kali? <laughs> cool. LS USB. Great, I've got it. So like, let's, uh, yeah, so this is the, um, the device name. Let's put it in monitor mode. Um, great, monitor mode. And then like, arrow dump ng on channel six. I'm not saving these packets to a file, but it would be easy to. Okay, so here's all of the Wi-Fi networks we see. Here's like, you know, data, I guess, this one, a lot of, wait, where did it go? This one, the open network has a lot of packets running through it right now. Um, and these are all clients connected to Wi-Fi. So anyway, you could totally just do whatever, like, USB accessories you want, and it, and it works pretty well in cubes. The only exception really actually is um, uh, if you're trying to do Android hacking and you're, like, flashing new firmware to, or, like, new ROMs to Android phones, 
the act of like the phone rebooting kind of disconnects the USB and breaks the pass through. And there's ways around it. You just need to like do it in your USB VM or um, attach your USB controllers to a different VM. But that's kind of more advanced. Um, okay. USB keyboards. All right. So by default. Uh, Cubes ha disables USB keyboards. Um, and most laptops, uh, the keyboards built into your laptop and also the trackpad aren't USB devices, they're PS2 devices. So they're not actually connected to your USB controllers. And so the reason why Cubes disables it by default is because keyboards are a very big security problem. And SysUSB has access to all of your USB devices. And because USB is like an attack vector, uh, it's totally possible, and the, since USB is a vault, it doesn't have internet access, but it's still possible that if you plug in a malicious USB device, it could hack that domain. And if there's malware running in it, it could like log your keystrokes through your USB keyboard. Um, but if you really want to use a USB keyboard, you can. Uh, you can change a setting and enable it, but, what you, but what's cool is that you can um, make it actually ask. So make it uh, prompt you in DOM0 if you want to trust this keyboard or not. So, um, Okay, so I found this USB stick outside on the sidewalk, and I'm really curious about what's in it. <laughs> Let's see. Oh, and so it pops up a window in DOM0 saying, do you want to allow uh, SysUSB to do the operations input keyboard um, on DOM0? And I'm going to actually say no, I don't want to allow that. And so. Really, like there's you know a, there's like a way of whitelisting USB devices in Linux. Uh, I forget what the software is called, and there's a couple of other things. But for the most part, like by default, there's no other operating system that protects you from malicious USB devices and isolates your whole USB stack from the rest of your computer. Um, I, th I don't actually remember what's on here. I think that when you plug it into a Mac, it'll open up a terminal and send a reverse shell to something. But it's been a while. <laughs> okay. So Cube's networking is very cool. Um, this is kind of what a default Cube setups look like when you first install Cube's. Uh, so SysNet, sort of like SysUSB Sys has access to all of your um, USB devices, SysNet similarly has access to your uh, Ethernet and Wi-Fi devices. And so this uh, network manager applet right now, it has a red border. This red VM is SysNet. So all of this is actually running inside of SysNet. Um, So uh, in this diagram, the blue boxes are called proxy VMs. And so a proxy VM is a VM that gives internet access to another VM or network access. And so when you like create a new VM in cubes, it's basically checking this provides network box. You can make a new proxy VM. So this firewall is a proxy VM. And um, SysHunix, Personal Work, and Untrusted all get their network from this firewall. SysHunix is a special case, and so a non-Hunix gets its network from SysHunix. So SysHunix is a proxy VM that runs Tor, and it transparently Torifies all of the traffic, uh, all of the like downstream traffic. So basically, whatever you do in a non-Hunix, it uh, is going through the Tor process that's running in SysHunix. So like you basically run Tor browser in a non-Hunix, um, and it, in the, in, but you could also run whatever else you want. You can like open up a you know, a document that tries to phone home inside of a non-Hunix, and it'll phone home over Tor, and it still won't leak your IP address. And so in a lot of ways, it's actually very similar to Tails, but um, unlike Tails, you could have as many of them as you want. And so Hunix VMs are great for compartmentalizing secret identities. So for example, if you were wanted to run a rogue government Twitter account, making a dedicated Hunix VM just for that activity, and you don't do anything except for stuff related to that like Twitter account, is uh, you know super useful. But then at the, on the same computer, you can make a different Hunix VM to you know talk to people securely. And so like, um, I'm not gonna open it because of time, but like I've got this a non-zero cool. Uh, 2018 uh, Hunix VM, and I've got an IRC client, and I've got like you know Pigeon where I could have like OTR encrypted chats with people over Jabber, and I've got like email set up and everything like that. Um, so as uh, a journalist, sometimes when I'm talking to sources that are pretty technical, and we want to make sure that the communication with sources is really difficult for anyone to uh, surveil, 
uh, I make a new Hunix VM just for that source. And I have like just the like internet connected stuff related to that VM all happen in that source. So I like make a new Jabber account and uh, like anonymously over Tor. And then they do the same thing on the other side. Um, and so it's a great, and so that way, like if anything else on my computer gets compromised, that communication with that source is completely a separate part of my system that doesn't get touched. Okay, so you can do a lot more cool networking stuff though. And here's an example of running a computer, a Cubes computer, like totally anonymously. So in this case, Sysnet has your Wi Fi or Ethernet. It, gives, it provides internet to Sys Firewall. It provides internet to Sys Hunix. Everything else goes into Sys Hunix or gets its internet from Sys Hunix. And the only exception is captive portal. So if you like connect to Wi Fi at Starbucks and it wants you to click through something, you open the one like kind of untrusted VM that gets its internet straight from uh, straight from like the IP address of the network you're connected to and you click through the thing and then you can connect it to Tor. And then beyond that, you could actually make new proxy VMs that connect to VPNs anonymously over Tor. So, um, so like in these examples, all the internet traffic goes over Tor. In these examples, all the internet traffic goes over a VPN, but the VPN service itself doesn't even know who you are and doesn't have your IP address. Um, and so this is how this laptop that I'm using right now is currently set up. Um, I've got Sysnet, goes to Sys Firewall. Then I have a VPN Germany, and then a VM called Research. So let's go ahead and open my Research VM. Um, where is it? Research. So, to, in or, so VPN Germany is a dependency of research, so VPN Germany is booting up first. Okay. And now research is booting. And up here, wait, where did it go? Right here. This is a separate network manager. Uh, so I actually have two different network managers. The, this one is running in Sysnet. This one is running in Sys Research. And let's go ahead and connect to this VPN in Germany. Okay. What is my IP address? Um, so I'm in. So this window is in Frankfurt. But like you know, over here, Cali right now. This window, uh, they're the same. There's only so many color options. <laughs> but uh, uh, Cali is in Lexington, US, which I guess is where um, this network thinks that we are. And then uh, this window is in Germany. So, but I also have, uh, okay, Sys Firewall going to Sys Hunix, going to VPN Hunix Hong Kong, going to a non VPN research. So let's go ahead and open. Um, a non-VPN research. So like what you would probably normally do on your computer is like make VPN Germany or whatever VPN your default net VM and make like all of these VMs all get its internet from the VPN. Um, and this way you can like ensure that you don't send any plain text traffic except for when you explicitly want to. Um, okay, so, oops. So now I have another network manager. Let's connect to a VPN in Hong Kong. And in this case, this other network manager is getting its internet, or this other uh, VPN, Hunix Hong Kong, gets its internet anonymously over Tor. Um, and then I'm connected. And so where am I in this window? Yeah, and so this is actually really um, oh, Hong Kong. So right now, this window, and actually really any VMs that I want that I attach to this VM, or to this uh, proxy VM, um, uh, are like very anonymous. It's basically like, uh, I mean, I guess there's a caveat that you have to figure out how to like pay for your VPN service anonymously too, and that's a whole different thing. But um, but using the internet anonymously can be really annoying with Tor browser because there's captchas everywhere. A lot of websites completely just block it or give you like different content if you're using Tor. Um, but in this way, you can get around all of that. You can use the internet anonymously and your VPN provider itself doesn't even know who you are. Um, yeah, and so like uh, this VM 
is, so just to recap, this Firefox is going over our normal network through Germany out to the internet. This Firefox is going through our normal network through the Tor network through Hong Kong out to the internet. And so you can basically like go to Kali, cube settings, um, right now, the network in Kali is this firewall. Let's just set it to VPN Hunix Hong Kong. And uh, OK. And now, here's my Kali VM. Let's refresh this page. Sorry, it's really slow because it's going over the Tor network and then over Hong Kong. And here we go. Here's like a totally anonymous like VPN over Tor Kali Linux. VPN over tour. Okay, so this is all very cool, but Cubes is still software written on a computer, which means that there are vulnerabilities um, and that there are ways to hack it. But in order to hack Cubes, step one is you have to hack one of the VMs using um, just a client side exploit. And this is basically the same way that you would hack Windows or Mac OS or Linux normally. Um, but then once you actually succeed in doing this, step two is you have to use a Cubes exploit. And in this case, this is actually. Uh, a Zen VM escape bug. And then what, if you do this, you could get arbitrary code execution in DOM zero, and if that happens, then it's game over and the attacker has hacked your whole computer and they could access everything. Um, but Cubes recognizes that Zen is kind of its biggest attack surface. And so it takes all these steps to try and reduce the attack surface of Zen. Um, uh, and so basically, in the, so here's some statistics. In the last like a little over seven years, only about 17% of the Zen vulnerabilities have actually affected, been affected by cubes. Um, but it still happens, like it happened last month, right? So uh, it's really important to still always install all of your updates. Um, okay, you can't do everything with cubes. One of the big things is uh, 3D acceleration just isn't supported in any of the VMs because it's very difficult to attach a like GPU to a VM in a way that doesn't allow the VM to have memory access to the whole system. Um, Windows support is limited. Uh, and other than that, it's basically Linux. Um, so if you want to use Mac stuff or Android or anything else, um, uh, it doesn't work very well. You can use various Linuxes and IS that you install from ISOs and that works. Um, and then there's a couple of other things. And one thing is it's still kind of, it's like, I mean, I don't think it's that hard to use, but if you want to set up your computer to do these cool things like this, there's not GUI for all of it. So you kind of need to uh, be a Linux nerd and be comfortable using the command line to do it very well. Um, and then also it, uh, doesn't really work on cheap low-end computers. You kind of need a good computer with a lot of RAM, but it does actually run on most PCs. It doesn't run on Mac hardware. Um, yeah, and so that is Cubes. Um, if you're interested, I'm having a workshop about Cubes at five o'clock somewhere in your schedule. Um, and I can like, I, I don't actually have any plans for the workshop other than if you wanna know how to do something, I could just show you, basically, is the idea. Um, yeah, any questions? I think there's a microphone somewhere. Fantastic presentation. Thank you very much, Micah. What a, a little bit more about hardware uh, compatibility, uh, brands perhaps, and uh, what about uh, 7 by 24 physical security for laptop? Do you worry about that at all? And how do you protect against it? Yeah, okay, so um, here's a link to the hardware compatibility list. Um, basically, Cubes has various uh, hardware requirements, and one of these is you need to have a, a computer that supports hardware virtualization, which all new computers have. So it works on a lot of things, but sometimes various things don't work on certain computers. So if you're thinking of like getting a new computer for Cubes, definitely like pick out your computer and then check this link to see if the computer is listed or not. And if it's listed, see if there's any like known problems. Um, and uh, oh, uh, physical security. Okay, so. Cubes helps you a lot with physical security in terms of, um, you know, like if somebody like walks over and plugs something into your computer where you're not looking, Cubes can protect against that, but it can't protect against evil made attacks. Um, and uh, like there's really like various mitigations to evil made attacks, but in the end, none of them work against all attacks. And so 
uh, carry your laptop with you everywhere you go, or if you want to, you can use an app called Haven and on a spare Android phone. So if you like leave your laptop in your hotel room, you leave an Android phone running Haven like sitting on top of it, and it uses all of its sensors to detect like intrusions into the room and sends you signal notifications. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, can you run top and DOM zero? Can you? Uh, yeah. I'm just curious. Yeah. <laughs> Qu question, uh, how much of the setup of cubes uh, can be done by default so that you're operating in a safe mode? For example, do you have the option to open attachments? Do you have to say all the time you want to open, open the attachment in this VM that's disposable, or can you accidentally open attachments in other VMs where they could do harm? Is there some way to make this thing more, yeah, so more foolproof, or rather, you know, error, error, more, to min, min, minimize the chance that you will, you know, you don't have to be on alert every time you open and click something. Right. Um, so, like for this folder of sketchy documents. Um, if I just double click on this, it'll open in my work VM, and that and that might be a mistake. And if I right click on it and uh, open in a disposable VM, then that'll manually do it. And so it's actually like uh, not built into cubes, but not too hard to design yourself. You can um, basically make a desktop file that says that it can handle. Uh, PDF file, the PDF MIME types, and then make it so that what that does is it launches QVM open in DVM. And so there's some of the stuff, like you, so like if you want to do things like this, Cubes totally makes it possible. You just have to like do a bit of like writing a little script yourself to do it. And I think that that's one of the things that, you know, will get better over time. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so you could, you could do stuff. You just need to know what you're doing and set it up manually. Yeah, because non-technical computer users constantly ask me, how can I use my computer safely? And this, this is still not the operating system for a non-technical user, but it might be one day, it sounds like. Yeah, and, and like the Thunderbird attachments, I feel like email attachments, always opening and disposal VMs, are really like, like that's pretty key because, uh, because email attachments are untrusted. And this is how, like, if it weren't for, uh, you know, spear phishing, the, like, election probably wouldn't have gotten hacked. So, uh, uh, yeah. Oh, look, there's an email. <laughs> I'll open that later. <laughs> <laughs> I think the question is a little bit related to the, to the question, uh, the last question. Um, how much intensive work is it, uh, I guess, it, is it a feature in the cubes uh, where you were linking to encryption keys in the email to yeah. passwords, or is it something that you had to write some scripts and, and configure? Um, it is a feature built into cubes. It's called split GPG. And here, let me okay. um, open a, a new disposable VM. Um, or I guess I could do it in this German one. <laughs> Uh, split GPG cubes. So it says the cubes website has a lot of really good documentation, including a lot of this stuff. So this explains how split GPG works and how to set it up. It requires like a little bit of manual setup. You need to basically like make a VM that has your secret keys in it, and um, then drop a file in the right place in the VM that you want to use your secret keys. So I like you know use a GPG VM. Um, that both my email VM and my software development VM connect to using split GPG, so that way you can like GPG sign git commits, but also use the same key to decrypt emails. Uh, how do you do the uh, backups for that guy? Uh, individual VMs get their own, or? So there is a backup and restore system um, that is actually really nice. It basically, um, uh, I guess it's hard to demonstrate without like plugging in an external disk. The backups will all basically have to be local. There's no like network backup, but um, you basically 
can like mount a disk in a VM and then tell this DOM zero which VM it's mounted in and where, where your, your backup location is. And then you just have like a list of all your VMs and you can say which ones you want to back up. And then you click start and then it takes, it actually takes like a long time. It takes like 45 minutes. But then when you're done, that like you just have like a giant file and then later you can get like a new computer and you just restore from that file and you have the exact same setup. No. Uh, let's see. I, when I checked the website, I noticed that Cubes itself is for x64 only at the moment. Uh, this might be barking up the wrong tree in terms of performant devices out there running on other platforms, but do you anticipate that it will be eventually supported? Um, like on ARM or other things like that? Yeah, since especially Zen apparently has an ARM. Oh, really? Yeah. Um, I don't know. What I do know is that the Cube's development team is like small. There's like three or four of them, and then there's like some volunteers. And I think that it's unlikely, unless they get like a lot of resources, that they're going to focus on a different platform other than just like x86-64. But maybe, hopefully, maybe someday they'll have like a hundred million dollars and can it'll work on everything. Uh, so you mentioned how important it is to protect DOM0, and if anything gets in DOM0, it's just game over. So it seemed sort of uh, counterintuitive that you plugged in the untrusted USB device and it immediately prompted you if you want to connect that to DOM0, right? And mm -hmm. why would you ever want to connect any USB device to DOM0? Because the USB device that I plugged in, it's a USB rubber ducky, and basically it tells computers that you plug it in that it's a human interface device, so a keyboard. and. Uh, you would never actually want to connect anything to DOM0 with the exception of keyboards, because if your keyboard isn't plugged into DOM0, you can't use it to use DOM0. So you can't actually like press Alt-Tab to switch windows, and you can't like type stuff in DOM0 windows and stuff like that. So to actually use a keyboard in cubes, you have to attach it to DOM0, which is one of the reasons why keyboards and cubes, USB keyboards and cubes are disabled by default. And I just keep them disabled. I used to use USB keyboards with like a docking station. Now I just have my like laptop and a monitor. And it, and mouse, mouses work, mice work fine. Okay, thank you. Cool, thank you.